So it's a spectrum, and I think people like to have binary. Often they, they look at these, someone's insulin resistant. You have to look at uh, the research that's come out in most of these studies where they're looking at benefits, let's say the keto diet on insulin resistant people, do not have the exercise component with them. And that's a pretty big factor because to me, everyone in the world, as long as they're, as long as, you know, as long as they possibly can, should be exercising. Welcome to the HVMN Podcast. It's your host, Jeff Wu. On our podcast, we talk a lot about how diet and exercise impacts metabolic health and performance. And today is no exception. I speak with Dr. Brad Schoenfeld. Brad is a drug-free natural bodybuilder who's turned into a research scientist who focuses on the mechanisms of muscle hypertrophy or muscle growth. Unlike some of our other guests, he's a bit more cautious on the applications of the ketogenic diet and fasting. So this is a good one to unpack the nuances of the topic. Brad and I discuss the ketogenic diet and intermittent fasting on muscle growth and what considerations there are, the impact of resistance training on insulin resistance, and discuss concepts like the protein leverage hypothesis. Dr. Schoenfeld, thanks so much for coming on the program. My pleasure. So perhaps to frame the conversation before diving in, I personally got interested in the human performance space broadly, more from a fasting, longevity, cognition perspective. And obviously, you've done a lot of work and published a number of interesting research papers on the broader human performance space. But I want to get back to how you even got into the space. I know you've been an award-winning bodybuilder. Curious to hear your personal story of how you got into the research space. Did it come from a personal interest of you you know, becoming a champion bodybuilder or was this always an academic intellectual interest or a bit of both? Kind of a bit of both. I mean, it came about my parent. both my parents were physicians. Uh, my father in particular had a very big influence on my early thinking and discussing the scientific method with me from the time I was yay high. Uh, but it really... Uh, Throughout my uh, earlier years, it, it was in the back of my mind, but never really came to fruition. And um, it, it came about, I would say, m mostly from a bodybuilding standpoint, because I started to see that using the routines of my favorite bodybuilders was not the way for me to get maximum hmm. jack. That might have gotten them maximum jack, but I didn't have their genetics nor their pharmacology, if you will. So I... Uh, decided that, hey, I, I started looking, how can I better maximize my own, optimize my own genetic uh, capabilities? And uh, that ultimately led me towards uh, research. And the more I started delving into it, the more interested I got in it. And uh, it was just kind of one of those things that snowballed and was, uh, it was a very nice marriage. Yeah. Out of curiosity, how does one, how did you get into bodybuilding? I mean, I think growing up, people look up at, you know, football or basketball or baseball as typical pursuits of athleticism. Obviously, bodybuilding is not unpopular, but I wouldn't say it's like the mainstream sport that you might get into growing up. How did you get into it? It really came about because I, it's kind of a typical story that I was this really skinny kid, which was very unhappy with my physique. I didn't ever think about going into bodybuilding, but I just wanted to develop my physique. And uh, once I started to train, I started seeing very large differences in my body initially, so I responded well. And over time, uh, coming from where I was this skinny kid and started to see my body evolve, it just kind of became a, I don't want to say a natural progression, but something that started getting to my mind that, hey, I was a skinny kid, now I have, you, you kind of want to prove to yourself that, hey, I can do this. And um, uh, other people started to, I got, uh, I started making friends with some people who were competing and they started motivating, giving me inspiration really. And I became motivated and you know, it was one of those things. It wasn't a aha moment. It just kind of evolved and right. saying, you know, this is something I really, the more and more I started getting into it, the more and more I started saying this is something I want to do. Yeah. And then again, just on the personal trajectory side, obviously, as you mentioned, the pharmacology side of bodybuilding, obviously, a lot of people are having added assistance with different consumables, injectables, all of that. Um, what was your personal process thinking through the risks there? And, and, and why did you go your path of staying more on, 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 on a natural path? I've been very pragmatic my whole life. And everything to me is cost-benefit, risk-reward. 
uh, I just did not see a good cost-benefit ratio to Dolphin. I have nothing against people that do. I've worked with many pro bodybuilders. Who were, not, not sure I don't make any judgments, just for myself, my personal. I, I just didn't think the health risk, I, I was never going to be Mr. Olympian, even if I was, the, to get to that level, the extent of drugs you have to take. But to win local shows, you know, like even like national level shows, it doesn't, it's nothing. It doesn't, uh, you know, if I was going to be a, an elite pro wrestler or athlete or something where you're making millions of dollars, I, I can't even say I'm not in that realm. But maybe different, uh, I, I would have thought differently. I don't know. I was never uh, put on, that, that was never presented to me. But certainly for me, I just never saw this as a very good risk reward, the health risks. And there certainly are health risks associated with it. Right. We're not good trade-offs to looking good for a given period of time, particularly when those attributes go away quickly uh, once you stop. So obviously that leads into the natural research areas that you've been prolific in, hypertrophy, okay, the the practice of making your muscles bigger. Um, so translating from more of a practitioner, an athlete, a competitor of in hypertrophy to being a researcher in hypertrophy. Tell us how you made that transition, what your initial research areas into that specific uh, physiological aspect of, of human performance. Yeah, so I was a personal trainer for many years, and I think uh, one of the reasons my research has become so popular is because I'm researching everything that is a personal trainer that I wanted to know. And I'm saying, well, why isn't this research out there? And that's resonated with a lot of fitness professionals because if I wanted to know it as a fitness professional, so do, so do they. Right. Uh, whereas I think a lot, most of the people in the field don't go through that progression. I was a personal trainer for 18 years and just saw every with all different demographics uh, from the highest level athletes and, and many bodybuilders all the way to geriatric uh, individuals and, and young uh, adolescents and everything in between, housewives, stock programs. So. Just any any and every demographic uh, population you can think of, I trained, and uh, it gave me just this wide experience and, and understanding of responses in the human body. So um, well, my trajectory from there was, I, I, like I said, started getting really interested in research. And then took, uh, while I was a personal trainer, took a uh, teaching position at a vocational school for personal trainers. And once I started teaching, I just said, this is now my, the course of what I want to do. I just, that was where a light bulb basically just went off in me. And uh, while I, I did love being a trainer for the time that I was doing it, uh, and by the way, I still do consult. Uh, I have limited, very limited clientele at this point, but I still like to keep my feet in the game. There's a, it, only, but I only do it at, at elite levels, like with uh, people who are high level bodybuilders, physique athletes. But the personal training just was a huge factor in my life, but it just progressed to the point where I got into teaching. And then once I got into teaching, I said, now I want to go on and become a professor. And I, and then I started realizing that research was a real um, focus of mine, that it was something that I really wanted to do. So they kind of went hand in hand. And um, it would take uh, a couple hours to go through the whole trajectory. Which yeah. You know, that. So that, that's kind of the short course. But once I started teaching, I just knew that's what I wanted to do. And ultimately, I went back for my PhD after that and uh, got my professorial job. Very cool. So what would you say are the biggest misconceptions in the personal training or application for hypertrophy that you see out there? Uh, and then given your practical clinical experience working with athletes and then also your research background, what do you think are the top one, two, three misconceptions that you like to clear or put out there? I think in the general public, the misperception is that uh, just go to the biggest bodybuilder and ask them what their routine is. Look, I fell into that trap as well. And that, hey, they have to be getting big for a reason. And it's true. Look, I'm certainly not diminishing that bodybuilders are they're doing stuff right or they wouldn't be as huge as they are. But it's also important to realize they have, as I mentioned, very good genetics and very good pharmacology. Um, and if you don't have that going, going to the guy with the 50 inch chest and the, uh, 22 inch guns is not going to get you his physique. So, uh, that to me is something that, uh, is unfortunately still, uh, permeates the, the field, particularly with those who were just starting out. Uh, but even with, uh, many high level bodybuilders, they're, look, I, I, and when I'm saying this, I, I'm not, 
want to emphasize that uh, bodybuilders, you're never going to get research that um, targets that population to the extent that you would want. And I, like I said, I work with uh, many, I've, I've worked with some of the top pros, I'm currently working with a pro right now, bodybuilder, getting him to his uh, contest. And um, there are things you do that you're not going to learn through research uh, just because uh, we don't study that. But the general, generalizability of the studies we have do not necessarily relate to that population. Or the individuality of each specific athlete, right? Like for you, when you're doing randomized controlled trial, this is a population level study. But when we're talking about specific elite athletes, there's obviously unique, different biochemistries between you and I and that and the professional athlete and, and a person on the couch. Obviously, there's huge individual variations. And by the way, that was going to be my next one, which I'll get into. But just when, when we're talking about studies that are carried out in trained individuals, which I carry out all the time, they are not elite bodybuilders. And elite bodybuilders are closer to their genetic ceiling. They have usually, obviously, their genetics generally are much better. They have incredible uh, drives to push themselves past where so there's just so many factors that go into it that you don't that you have to take into account that research is so basically and this is where I was going to get to next I think another misperception in people that are research based if you will or evidence based is that research is never going to tell you what to do research only provides general guidelines to giving you a kind of a ballpark as to where to start at, in terms of prescription, exercise prescription, and then it's always going to come down to using your expertise and then looking at the needs and abilities of the individual to formulating a customized program. So I think that kind of takes us from the total novice general person who just follows the bros to the uh, people who pretend to be more evidence-based but don't really grasp that you're not going to get what you want Research is not going to say, "Hey, this. I just. I'm going to give you the Ten Commandments of of how to train at this point. You just do this." Right. Because that that is the evidence based approach is a three pronged approach that looks at what the best current evidence is, the needs and the abilities of the individual, and your expertise. And that is really the art. That's where you're bridging the gap between science and practice, and that's where the art of, of prescription comes in. Right. So when you look at a a specific client or specific elite athlete, your genetics, that's not something we can control. At this time, maybe in 20 years, you can CRISPR people and then you can actually alter their genetics. But at, at current status quo, you're not really touching people's genetics. But what you can control and you, what you can manipulate is their exercise protocol, both the types of workouts and the types of recovery that you do. And I would say the second component is diet, um, nutrition, um, Supplementation or, or or potential you know steroids pharmacology. Um, when you work with clients, you know, how much is weighted towards the former, the interventions in terms of exercise and recovery, and how much is weighted toward diet and nutrition? Obviously, it's going to be a bit of both. Um, would you uh, walk through how you would approach both of these levers in terms of optimizing an elite performer? Yeah, when you say walk through, it's you go through a need, you find out what the person's doing. So, I mean, I'm, I'm the nutritional consultant for the New Jersey Devils hockey team. Uh, and it's kind of the same thing. Now, when you're the – the most important thing is creating a program that they're going to be want, willing and able to adhere to. So bodybuilders usually are the easiest population to work with in that regard because you tell them how to train and how to eat, and you tell them that this is going to get them in their best contest shape, and they're, they're going to eat grass off the lawn if you tell them to and they're going to train however however they uh, are instructed basically uh whereas other athletes there's it's a much more it, it gets harder first of all with their bodybuilder training and nutrition is everything their their competition is a one shot really non performance performance but it's not really an athletic performance whereas if you're coaching athletes like I do with hockey players they're getting creamed in the game, so they have game time. There's just all sorts of other confounding issues that are going to get intermingled in with uh, their training and their nutritional regimens get thrown off out of whack sometimes being on the road. And so, again, it's really hard to give you a cookie cutter on that because it's just very individual. You would be looking at, uh, like I said, looking to research. I'd be training, obviously, if you're looking at an athlete, they're going to be, that's much more sports-specific. Whereas a bodybuilder, if you want to talk about hypertrophy specifically, 
that would be where the muscle development and the fat loss are, uh, are paramount. That's what you're going to be judged on. So low body fat and high muscle. And uh, you're, you're just going to look at what the you know, sport entails and then uh, understand, have a general plan based upon what you know through research and what you also know uh, through your workings with individual athletes. Like I said, research has limitations with, uh, with high-level bodybuilders and high-level athletes in general, but certainly with bodybuilders. So uh, there's going to be a lot of nuance there, and that's why having worked, uh, there are people dismiss it, but having worked with bodybuilders extensively is a very important factor, I believe, in terms of getting people into their best content. Yeah, perhaps I gave an overly broad question there. So maybe to make it a little bit more specific, um, I think if you look at the bodybuilding sort of bro science sort of milieu, a lot of people will talk about eating six meals a day, never be hungry, have a lot of high protein, be lower on carbs, lower on fat. And then I would say within uh, the last three, five years, there's an uptick in popularity of the ketogenic diet, uh, maybe some intermittent fasting, uh, maybe do some fasted workouts before loading up on more of a protein and, and higher fat content diet. Um, obviously, there's applications for any specific diet for any number of indications, but perhaps specifically for hypertrophy, given your experience, um, can you kind of give us the pros and cons of a six meal a day type of a protocol versus a intermittent fasting, 16, eight lean gain sort of protocol or, or what, or, or what sort of protocols have you seen become popular in the bodybuilding hypertrophy world? So from a fat loss standpoint, there really is no tangible benefits to, uh, to more frequent meals, uh, certainly to have more than three and really no good evidence that there's any, uh, meal frequency uh, that would be optimal for fat loss. So you can get you can lose probably similar levels of body fat at almost any meal frequency, and that's why intermittent fasting works certainly fine for that. I am not a fan of uh, intermittent fasting or ke or ketogenic diets for maximal hypertrophy stand from my uh, optimal muscle building standpoint uh, for somewhat different reasons. The intermittent fasting limiting. If you're going to limit, let's say, your food to eight hours, I mean, that means that for 16 hours, basically, you're going to be catabolic or not maybe, let's say you're eating at the edge of that eight hours. So at that eight hour, the anabolic effects of a meal are going to last, let's say, five hours. So at most, at best, you're at uh, 11 hours of catabolism, where if you're eating, you want to be anabolic all the time, you can shorten that window. And how much is that difference is that going to make? Well, if you're a bodybuilder, it could make a difference. If you're the average person, probably not going to. So again, now it's context dependent. If you're asking me for the average individual who just wants to gain some muscle and move out, I, I think it's ketogenic diets, intermittent fasting, low fat, I, really almost anything is going to work provided you, you're managing your calories properly and that your protein levels are on target. That's going to be the, the essential. From muscle building standpoint, um, like I said, the intermittent fasting, spreading out your protein intake across the day, and it's particularly the protein aspect, so having, I would say, four, at least four protein-based meals from a muscle building standpoint would optimize your anabolic potential. So if they're spaced out every four to five hours, then you're at your anabolic windows, if you will, where you're going to keep your body anabolic throughout the day and throughout much of your sleep, if you're depending upon when you're going to eat your last meal before sleep. And of the ketogenic diet, the issue there is that glycogen – and these, by the way, both of these are not well studied. Certainly, like I said, for the average individual, it's probably not going to make a great deal of difference. But the issue with the ketogenic diet, and there's some evidence of this in the literature, it's just not much research on it in general. But uh, glycogen is an energy sensor. So you're going to, uh, there's a primary catabolic pathway is called the AMPK pathway. I'm not sure how. I was going to actually follow up with some questions about that. So perfect. K is a catabolic pathway. It's an energy sensing pathway. When glycogen levels are low, AMPK is going to tend to get raised. Now, it's a lot of issues in terms of research on AMPK anyway, but just at least conceptually, it's going to uh, put you in more of a catabolic state because the purpose of AMPK is to initiate catabolism to bring your energy state back, meaning to raise your glycogen. So basically it's going to um, block or tend to impair 
blunt the initiation of mTOR, which is an anabolic uh, enzyme, anabolic signaling agent, and thus it's just that in itself would uh, would tend to lead you to think that it's not going to be the greatest for muscle building. And look, the 80% of a bodybuilding style routine is fueled by glycogen, in, intramuscular glycogen. Uh, so when you're going to deplete, substantially deplete glycogen as you do in a ketogenic diet, you're not going to have the energy, if you will, to, to fuel the workouts as well. Not that you can't get through a bodybuilding workout, but just that your performance would tend to suffer. So, um, and there's, there's been a recent study that did show somewhat less growth, muscle growth, when they had a ketogenic diet. Fat loss was similar, but ketogenic diet did not uh, promote as good growth of muscle. Uh, these diet studies are very difficult to carry out. I'm always somewhat skeptical because you tell people to do certain things. When you, we can control a training study when people are there right. and they're, how they're training. When you have a diet study and you're telling your, unless you're in a metabolic ward and you're telling people what to do, adherence from my personal experience and, and from what I've seen in the literature as well, it just is not great. So um, I completely agree. I think you look at a lot of the epidemiological studies. It's just like people are reporting like 1,800 calories a day, which is clearly they're not eating 1,800 calories a day. But not even epidemiologic. I'm talking about randomized controlled trials. Sure. We yeah. put someone on a diet, and I, I mean, I've done this. You know, I've, I've been yeah. involved in these studies, and you tell them what to eat. Now, ketogenic diets, it's a little easier to tell whether they're doing it because you can measure the ketone levels at least uh, to, to get some insights. It's kind of hard to know what the other – but you, you're also not knowing what the calories are, so – Anyway, these are just confounding issues that make drawing uh, practical implications, practical inferences difficult. Yeah, no, I think you bring up a good point because usually we bring a lot of folks studying insulin resistance, low-carb diets, and uh, the application of diet nutrition for longevity or pre-diabetes or neurological conditions. And I think you're adding a refresh of angle, refreshing angle here that there's it's not a free lunch. If you are inhibiting mTOR, uh, which is an anabolic pathway, which that might have good applications for longevity or metabolic syndrome applications. But if you're looking for athletic performance or bodybuilding or hypertrophy applications, then that's the that's a trade-off that you're making. So if you're trying to be the most jacked person ever, um, that's a completely different goal than I want to live as long as possible and potentially minimizing my functional strength and my health span. If I can interrupt there too, I, I, I'd add two things. Number one, this is not my area of expertise, the longevity angle, but I have looked at some of that research. Yeah. Uh, I think it's very – now there's – I'm not saying it, it might not pan out, but I think that people are drawing implications from research like on starfish, you know, the, uh, <laughs> the generalizability to – uh, humans, I think, is very tenuous there. That, that's number one. And number two, the other thing when we talk about like metabolic syndrome, et cetera, you have to also remember that uh, resistance training, exercise in general, resistance training in particular, has profound effects on uh, improving insulin sensitivity. Yep. Uh, probably even more so than, no, I'm not saying that obviously diet is very important there, but um, both in terms of sensitizing the insulin receptors and also your glucose transporters, which are what bring the glucose into the cell. And those are really tend to be the issues. Now, if you have full-blown diabetes, uh, type 2 diabetes, again, I'm not uh, – That's and this is somewhat outside. I'm not a clinical exercise physiologist. I'm a performance – I'm a strength and conditioning specialist in performance enhancing. But I'm certainly familiar to a good extent with that research. So it's a spectrum, and I think people like to have binary – often they, they look at these – someone's insulin resistant. You have to look at – uh, the research that's come out in most of these studies where they're looking at benefits, let's say, the keto diet on insulin-resistant people, do not have a exercise component with them. And that's a pretty big factor because, to me, everyone in the world, as long as, they're, you know, as, long as they possibly can, should be exercising. Yep. I think we actually agree there where having large lean muscle tissue is one of the best markers for longevity. I think one, because you have large muscle mass, it's actually one of the best glucose sinks, right? You actually can pull down the sugar. And I think as you're saying, it's actually one of the biggest uh, drivers for maintaining insulin sensitivity. So I think there is that trade-off. Okay, we likely might want to limit 
activating mTOR all the time, but we don't want to do it to a point of having no muscle mass. That's not the trade-off in terms of what you want. So what is that sweet spot? I think that's a little bit open to open science. And I think we're all figuring out you know, what works broadly and then also what works specifically for each individual. Great. Yeah. I think one thing that I think is interesting, and maybe this is, again, just more puzzling through your thinking rather than asking for, you know, a generic, you know, bite, you know, uh, bite-sized answer here is that one of the big debates for what drives obesity is this calories in, calories out model, which drives most of the rationale behind obesity or the carbohydrate insulin hypothesis. Uh, I saw that you've tweeted about that recently. Um, I think there's good arguments for a little bit of, on, on why both are reasonable explanations or models here. Uh, curious to get your thoughts about either frameworks and the pros and cons in your in your perspective. Look, the uh, first law of thermodynamics, it's a law for a reason. It's not it's not a theory, it's a law. So um, we and and there is extrap I know some people argue against extrapolation to humans, but I, I dispute that and I think everything in the literature to this point shows that. Here's what I would say. Here's where I think the literature is quite clear because we have metabolic ward studies. So a lot of times, I know a lot of the keto proponents with the insulin hypothesis will cite some, they'll basically cherry pick on studies that were done in free living populations who can misreport uh, data on, in terms of their energy intake data, their macronutrient data, not just the keto people, but the ones in the, probably the misreporting I think would happen even more in the low fat group because keto, one of the benefits to keto, at least uh, from everything we can glean from the literature is that there are properties within being on a ketogenic diet that do suppress hunger. Now that in itself, you could say that, but that is consistent with calories in calories out. It's, a, it, it's almost that people on this on the keto bandwagon want it, they have to have this they're holding on to dear life for this insulin hypothesis, and I don't see why that's necessary personally, and I don't think it's supported in any way by the literature. Uh, we know that by these metabolic ward studies, where people are given food, so they and and their energy levels are controlled, their energy expenditure levels are controlled. Uh, there was a recent meta analysis by a colleague of mine, uh, Dr. Kevin Hall, who's one of the premier researchers yep. on the topic. Uh, there were 32 studies where the uh, in the only used studies that where the food was provisionally provided uh, by the researchers. So basically, they knew that the subjects were getting uh, they were uh, eating what they were given. Basically, they were they were not they couldn't misreport, if you will. Now whether they they were in awards, so people were monitoring all their food. Correct. Actually, they showed a slightly greater. I, I don't necessarily buy this either. They showed a slightly greater fat loss uh, from the low fat component. And I think that is just statistical noise personally. I don't see any reason why that would deviate from, but look, there, so there are now, and that's when protein levels are controlled. So, so basically they're controlling, they're clamping protein and calories. It's very important with protein because it's not, when we talk calories in, calories out, then people say, well, then you're saying uh, Skittles are the same as eating a, a steak. And no, that doesn't say that because the thermodynamics, their protein has a much higher, um, multiple factors, but uh, protein itself has a thermic effect of food. Now, protein also has a satiating effect. There's yep. the protein, there's protein leveraging hypothesis as well, which causes you to want to eat more. So the calorie, there's no, there's a difference between saying a calorie is a calorie and saying that, um, and that basically all calories are created equal versus saying that energy in energy balance is what drives. Uh, weight loss or weight gain weight loss and that's pretty well established I, I don't think personally that that is debatable I, yeah. I, and within that I just also mentioned there are nuances that influence like neat to so non-exercise activity you, it's, you have to look at what the components are of energy intake we know is the food that you're eating but even then you have thermic effect of food for different macronutrients you have non-exercise activity thermogenesis which is neat um, there are things like gut health which may be uh, might make certain foods less metabolizable than others. And so all of these factors are, uh, again, can mitigate your energy balance. Right. And that's why it is a much more complex. It's some people want to then simplify it and use a straw man. And that's not fair either. Hey, listeners, if you're enjoying this episode thus far, please consider writing a review on our iTunes page. It really does help increase the visibility of our podcast. That's really the best way to support our work. 
In appreciation for your review, we'll hook you up with $15 of HVMN store credit. We also love it when we see you guys share our episodes that you've enjoyed on your Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook. And we often reshare those posts. Just tag us at our handle, at HVMN. Now, back to the show. I think on the carbohydrate insulin hypothesis model, I don't think anyone is arguing you can eat 10,000 calories of fat and there are people that do argue oh, that. okay so I think I think that's where it's interesting where it's like I think those people are a little bit too far on on the straw man side of things and I think and and I think that what you were referencing if you eat 3,000 calories of skittles versus 3,000 calories of a well formulated diet that is equivalent that's probably too far on that side as well and I think the I think the folks that are actually engaging and looking at the science are actually a, much closer because I think as you're mentioning, on a ketogenic diet, beta hydroxy beta rate is potentially shown to reduce ghrelin, reduce appetite. So that might drive a lower caloric intake. And then it's like, okay, what drives what? And I think there's an actual discussion there. Um, and it sounds like uh, I think the Kevin Hall study, I, uh, the the one that I recall, seems to be that the ketogenic, the the the, the lower carb group had a little bit higher metabolic expenditure, but it wasn't super sizable. So I think, you know, the people on the low carb side of the story would be like, okay, that's still something. And the people on more of the other side of the story say, hey, that's like very low. Like the, the difference is like not negligible. So I think to me, it's a little bit, I mean, I, I think there's, there's a debate for a reason where it's it's not 100% clear. Otherwise, I think, right. You're mixing studies. So the study I was talking about was a systematic review and made an They did a meta analysis of 32 studies. Yeah. That were done. So basically, a meta analysis is where you pool the results of all the studies on a given topic. So they took every study that was done where food provision was given, mm -hmm. and they combined them into one very, very large study. The study you're talking about was it was a really interesting study that was carried out in the metabolic ward. Yep. Now the issue there, so there was a a spike in a brief spike in metabolism in the low carb group. The only issue was it went back to baseline in 15 days and the total expenditure uh, of, of calories during that spike was roughly a thousand calories. And it's at least theorized that was just due to gluconeogenesis where the body is shifting its use of. So in the interim between where the body starts to use, utilize ketones, there is a period where it's going to start to catabolize proteins, particularly for uh, for glucose, gluconeogenesis, yeah. and that's an energy intensive process. At least my understanding, or that would be my interpretation of why you saw this blip. Yep. But that doesn't mean that it went back basically to baseline in 15 days. So that would not have uh, kept up, or there's no reason to believe that it would have went back up again. Right. There was a spike and then just narrowed down. Where the difference was was arguably. Some something worth fighting for or negligible. And I think depending on what you know side of the cup you're looking at, that's something that people can interpret as they see fit. Uh, yeah, no, I think that's right. I I haven't seen the meta analysis paper, which I'd be interested in taking a look to understand uh, in, in, in that result. Um, you mentioned the protein leverage theory, uh, something I think is an interesting and has interesting explanatory power. Could you explain it to our audience? Yeah. So simply stated, the protein leverage hypothesis is really a more of a hypothesis. A theory would be something, I guess it's, a, or it's kind of a weak theory, but um, it depends which way you go. But it, it basically states that the body strives to uh, take in a certain amount of protein. And when it's not getting sufficient protein, you're going to have a drive to be hungrier and you'll start eating all sorts of foods generally just to try to make up and get yourself more protein. And the reason, at least from a conceptual standpoint, it dates back to the caveman area. If you start to not take in enough protein, you're not going to have enough muscle to be strong enough to hunt and to get away from your uh, people that are animals that are chasing you and be able to build your hut uh, or whatever it is that you have to do work in the field. So uh, the body will then try to bring itself back to protein homeostatic to, to a certain homeostatic protein level uh, by taking in more food and thus if you're, it's saying that if you're, uh, if you're at protein, if you're eating enough protein, you feel more satisfied, and there's not this need to continue eating, so you'll have less, less hunger, and thus generally you're going to be uh, less prone to gaining weight. Right, and then the the extrapolation there is that the standard Western diet, the standard American diet, has a lot of processed carbohydrate, fatty foods with low protein quality. So you're just eating a bunch of this carb fat stuff. And because you're not getting enough of that protein, uh, you just eat more and more and more. 
trying to cover that protein deficit. So if you eat a lot of protein, that has leverage because your body senses that you have enough protein, you eat less of the carbohydrate and fat. Yeah, that's correct. Now, that's why, again, I kind of think it's still more where it's a weak theory or I think there's something to it. So it's not, but I think to that as a fully explanatory mechanism is still sketchy because the Western diet has very highly palatable food. So they actually, I believe it was Kevin Paul's again lab that just did this study where they gave subjects ad libitum uh, entree to either very highly processed, palatable, highly palatable foods or unprocessed foods. And the people that were given access to the highly palatable foods, I think it was over the course of two weeks, I forgot the, it was a crossover design, so the same people, they ate like an extra 500 calories a day. I don't know what, how much of that might have been due to protein leverage or just because of the food being just very highly palatable as well. And was it the same macronutrient ratio? No, you know, again, I'm, I'm okay. Just, my mind is a little blank at this point. I, I read over the study, but I forget. I read so many studies. Yeah. Uh, I got to actually go back and, and reread. I somewhat skimmed it. Uh, but it was, to me, just a very interesting uh, study that uh, I think kind of shows that palatability of foods, when you have a- unlimited access, as we do today, to highly palatable foods, it drives, look, when I'm eating a chocolate cake, or actually, I don't like chocolate cake, a cheesecake, which is something I really like, I can pretty much polish off an entire cheesecake if I'm left to my, if I don't say, you know what, I'm going to, I'm not going to be able to get off the couch the next day if I keep doing this. If I had, so I do have some willpower. But if I didn't, and there's people that, that are lacking in that realm, uh, it, it makes you want to eat more. Or if I'm eating a, uh, it's like salmon, I love salmon, but I'm just not going to eat, you know, a pound of salmon. I, yep. I can, I, I can, uh, uh, exert willpower a lot more readily in that than I, I would with, let's say, a cheesecake or something. Like yeah, that. and I think that's backed by physiological biomarker data, right? Where proteins, lipid more satiated, or fats more satiated than carbs. So it's, I think, I think we all subjectively understand that you could probably eat a lot of candy or cake, and you probably can't eat that much steak, um, <laughs> even though like steak is great. Um, I wanted to move on to the anabolic window. Uh, discussion where I think you were one of the first, if not the first, to popularize the concept around, hey, the window of having to have that post-workout protein is actually much wider than typically recommended in the bro science community, where I think a lot of people will say, you must have your protein workout, uh, protein shake 30 minutes after a workout, or you miss the anabolic window and you totally ruined your post-recovery uh, protocol. Talk us through the research and how you kind of blew a hole in, 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 in that misconception. Yeah, so I, I actually was a big uh, proponent. When I say proponent, I was a believer. I kind of deferred to one of the authority figures who were preaching this at the time. Uh, and uh, I actually have an entire chapter in one of my books uh, where I just found on the importance of the anabolic window. So shame on me. So, I shouldn't say shame on me. I was naive to that point, but. Uh, the important thing is I took another look at this. A colleague of mine uh, started raising questions about it, and I, uh, I looked into the um, – I, I started really delving into the research and started saying, you know what, it's really not what uh, it seems to be. And uh, I first collaborated with my with a colleague of mine, Alan Aragon, who's a nutritionist in the field, first opened my eyes to this concept, and we collaborated on a paper – 2013, I believe it was, and a real review of the literature. And really, our that paper, just the uh, actual review, narrative review, didn't seem to turn up much. Uh, we then went and I said, you know what, to me, uh, this needs a made analysis. There's enough studies here. We can pool the data, which we did. And uh, again, a pooling of the data really showed that it was not when you're eating, or, or at least a narrow window of when you're eating. It was the, the studies that actually were showing benefits were largely due to the fact they were giving a placebo. So mm-hmm. they were giving like uh, sugar, sugar water instead of protein. So the other group was taking in uh, roughly uh, 0.4 grams more protein, so 1.7 grams per day versus 1.3. And we do know through the literature, it's pretty clear that roughly around 1.6, 1.7 is kind of the lower threshold for what you need to be in, in an anabolic environment. So it's the total daily, basically what we found from this made is that it's total daily protein uh, that really drives um, 
anabolism, total anabolism. All right, what I would say is that it's not that there is no anabolic window. So I, now people have kind of, again, they straw man this. And that's, oh. Yep, yep. I was going to ask for a nuance here. So, again, it does come down to nuance. Number yeah. one, there. what I would say is that the studies do show, most of them show very slight benefits regardless, even the ones that have controlled for protein intake. Um, so if I'm, if I'm talking about the average Joe or Jane uh, that I'm coaching, would be coaching, there's not going to be any difference. But if you're a bodybuilder, it probably makes sense to take, take it in earlier rather than later. Uh, there's no downside to taking it in earlier. And number two, what we've started to glean from the literature is that it comes down to th – there's, there's a window, but the window is more like a barn door. <laughs> barn door window. Uh, where it's a fairly wide window that should last probably five to six hours. Look, muscle is sensitized, we know, for 24 hours. I wouldn't want to wait till 24-hour mark before I'm taking in protein. Because uh, you're just losing out on on a lot of that barn door, if you will. Right. But if you're eating, really, what we've found is that you should think about the training uh, workout as brackets around your meal. So if you're having a pre-workout meal, the anabolic effects, like I said, are lasting roughly five hours or so, assuming there's sufficient protein in there. If you're going to eat breakfast, lunch, dinner, and let's say a late night protein shake or whatever. So let's say you're having 7 a.m., 12, 5, and 10. Uh, you're having meals around the clock. To be, you'd be in your anabolic window no matter what. You wouldn't have to sweat at all. So no matter when you're training within that block, there's, you're going to be anabolic. So it's not going to really affect you. Uh, where it seems to have more relevance would be if you are training fasted in the morning, or uh, I would say if you're going to, uh, if you're on an intermittent fasting schedule, you'd probably want to structure it where you're within you're not going to probably shouldn't be training well outside of your intimate fasting yeah that makes a lot of sense so essentially the nut of it is that if you're not trying to get that percentage 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 the you which you you would be if you're an elite athlete or trying to win a body, mr olympia then the it's a really a barn door just make sure you get enough calories to stay anabolic don't be calorically restricted and you'll probably be fine which right. is which which is probably helpful for a lot of folks looking to not freak out if they forgot their protein shake after their workout. Like this, is okay. You're, you're as long as you get enough protein in the next few hours, you're going to be okay. They don't need to bring that uh, shaker in and slam that shake the second they're they're done. Which you see a lot of times in the gym. Absolutely. Um, one of the interesting papers that you worked on, published recently, was the fa was a fasted cardio study. So. Um, I would say that a lot of our listeners probably are interested in doing fasted workouts or fasted cardio for uh, not for bodybuilding purposes, but more for you know blasting out any remaining glycogen, maybe some of the metabolic effects there, um, which we could talk about. But and I think your study really showed that the fat loss difference was negligible, you know, at best uh, if there's any benefit. Uh, Let's can we can you unpack that study uh, and, and and tell us about your work there? Yeah, so we had and that study probably is five years old now, so it's okay. uh, time flies. But yeah, we had basically I had uh, I think of it from a bodybuilding context or fat loss. This would be fat loss context where you know I I'm old enough to remember the Bill Phillips book. I don't know if you do called Body for Life. These, I think it's still the best selling fitness book of all time, hmm. uh, exercise book. But uh, Bill was a very innovative guy, and he recommended that you do cardio fast. And his point, uh, I will paraphrase, was that if you did a HIT session, high intensity interval session, uh, first thing in the morning, fast, that it creates greater fat loss than if you did an hour of steady state cardio later in the day after a meal. It was something to that effect. Mm -hmm. And um, when I started delving into that literature, uh, I started seeing a lot of holes in that. Now, in fairness to Bill, too, when he advocated that, it was the late 90s, and uh, there was very little literature on that. So he was basing it on worth a few studies that I think you could make that leap at that point where more, the more recent stuff actually kind of dispelled that. Uh, but the really, it was really mostly acute studies where they would look at, they would just have someone do an acute bout 
and then look at what their fat burning was, their, their fat oxidation over the course of that bout. And hopefully we all, well, some people don't, that what you're burning during a workout does not necessarily reflect what you'd burn over a 24 hour period versus a week period. You know, yep. it's really for looking at fat loss, it's not what you're burning in this limited time of training. It's what you're burning over time. And I, I published a review paper, uh, I think around 2011, but there was very little studies on, controlled studies on fat loss. So there were a few studies that were longitudinal, but they had, they didn't have a dietary component. So we actually gave people a diet where they were following, they were in a fat loss diet, energy restricted diet. What was the macros like? Was it just a standard macro breakdown or did you have a keto arm? It wasn't, it wasn't a keto diet, but it was a higher protein. It was kind of probably more you'd consider it like a 40, 30, 30, you know, kind of like a zone type of diet. But uh, it was just a, a basically a, a, a basic diet that was somewhat high in protein to make sure we, we clamp protein, I think, at 1.8 grams per kilogram, if I remember. Uh, again, it's been a while since we carried out that study, so I don't recall these specifics, but it was around there. And we had them do three days of cardio. One, it was steady state cardio. We didn't do HIT because the recent research showed that lipolysis is the breakdown of, of fatty acids from fat cells. So there is increased lipolysis. The thing is that you can actually use that, oxidize these fat uh, you know, the fat for energy. Uh, and that doesn't happen with the very high intensity cardio. It's anaerobic. It's a lot more fat than yeah. you can actually oxidize and it ends up getting re-esterified, stored back in your fat cells. So we did the steady state, which at least the literature shows has the potential for greater uh, usage and from an oxidation standpoint. Yep. It, we gave one group a shake right before the uh, training. We gave the other group the shake after the training, so that was a two to one carb ratio, something 250 calories. Anyway, uh, after the so one of them was training faster, the other it was 10 subject uh, 10 subjects in each group, and they were young women, and really no differences. There was zero tangible differences in their fat loss or body comp at all. When you're now talking about health perspective, so from a fat standpoint, fat loss standpoint, I just there's no evidence that it is beneficial in that respect when you're looking at it over the course of a longitudinal period of time yeah. in teaching body comp. Um, from a metabolic step, from a, you're talking about metabolic effects as far as on health, that again is somewhat outside of my sphere of expertise. I've seen some of that research. Some of the studies I that I've seen acutely did show some benefits. Now, again, you got to remember, and I might not know the other studies that have looked at it longitudinally, but you also have to remember that your body adapts over time. So what if you're doing an acute study, you cannot necessarily extrapolate that, hey, I have this acute study and we're showing greater uh, insulin sensitivity. Well, is that going to continue over four weeks, six weeks, eight weeks, a year, two years, five years? Yeah. You can't extrapolate. That's, you cannot generalize that, and that's why acute studies – are good for generating hypotheses, but they're not they, they're not indicative. You cannot infer long term results from that. I agree. How long was your study? Was it a two week? Four week. Four week study. Yep. Yeah, I think one of the interesting things that I'd love to see. I don't I don't know if anyone's done this study. Is I believe you get a, an acute increase in fat oxidation on the fasted population, but as and as you were saying, but as you refeed, you're probably. Uh, and especially if you're refeeding on a standard higher carb con uh, uh, macronutrient diet, you're probably uh, sort of wiping out the increase in fat oxidation, sort of upregulating those pathways. So I could see, I'd be curious to see if you do fasted cardio, then following on on a ketogenic diet, which doubles down on the fat oxidation and fat fatty acid uh, utilization um, versus fasted cardio on a standard Western diet versus a non-fasted workout in a normal diet as a, as a third arm. That would be interesting in terms of just, just teasing out, is there the, the upregulation of fat oxidation on a fasted cardio, does that carry over into diet? And therefore, could you potentially see increased fat loss? I don't know if there's studies that have looked at that, but I would if, if there is, I would, uh, that would be interesting to, to hear. There's other things you have to consider too. So when we're looking at fat oxidation, where is the fat coming from? What depots? So we know that intramuscular fat, roughly 50% of exercise, um, this has been shown 
readily over multiple studies, 50% of the fat that's oxidized from exercise is through intramuscular and untrained individuals. Mm -hmm. When people become more trained, your body gets better at storing intramuscular triglycerides. I, that is not going to make tangible effects on your your body. So if you're burning more intramuscular fat, that's not necessarily better, from a, at least from a body standpoint, body fat standpoint. That's number one. Number two, there is a thermic effect of exercise that seems to be blunted from uh, being fasted. When are you then going to eat? So there's so many other factors. Just looking at that narrow window within the time that you're exercising is very short-sighted, in my opinion. And um, I, I'm not saying there may not be benefits from a health standpoint. Uh, and by the way, babe, can there be? We did one study, so you never look at one study yeah. to be involved. Do another study. I did mention that uh, the free living conditions, some of the food diaries that I was getting did not. You look at some of the food diaries and you're saying, I, you know, this person is gaining a pound and they're reporting they're eating 1,200 calories. So, yeah. I, I, I'm just kind of throw your hands up and without having a, me a metabolic ward study, and I don't think anyone's funding that, certainly for me, for for a group of college-age students. Now, maybe for a health perspective, you'd get that. Yeah. No, no, I think you bring up a good counter-argument there, which is that uh, no one would recommend doing a fasted competitions, right? Like, you definitely fuel before a cycling race or a football game or body or I, I don't know, I don't know about bodybuilding but for an actual workout if you actually want to maintain peak performance you definitely want to be fueling and I think it's a good argument that if you're fueling you have a better workout you actually increase the amount of exercise load do you do does that overcome the fasted uh the fasted nature of that workout maybe I, I think that's a good open question um uh I want to move on to just looking at bodybuilding as a sport I mean obviously you've, you've been in the game for decades. Um, what has been the biggest shifts in, in the sport um, from when you were up and coming as a young, you know, competitor in, in the sport, and now you coaching elite, uh, prof you know, elite performers in, in the bodybuilding space? What has been the biggest changes? Is it much more dialed in in terms of quantitative biomarker tracking, or is it or are people a lot more sophisticated, sophisticated around pharmacology of their of their inputs? Uh, probably a little of that. I mean, I'm curious. Like, what is the most surprising thing that has changed over the years? It's a, somewhat of an open ended question. It would depend upon what um, segment of the population you're talking about. If you're talking about pro IFBB pro bodybuilders versus um, the nat natty bodybuilders and other I, i'm so i'd say certainly at the pro level pharmacology is the primary thing since i i was a product of the 90s with my bodybuilding and um the bodybuilders of that era you look at their physiques versus the uh, physiques of today and it's just it's like dinosaurs against kitties uh, you know uh, so the pharmacology has gotten crazy and the pro bodybuilding now there's a at least a move to dial that away the most recent Mr. Olympia winner at least was more aesthetic than going back at least a decade of uh, Olympias and probably two decades at this point even. Um, but I think the biggest shift from an overall standpoint in terms of your general bodybuilders, and I think this is a positive, is that there is now more, um, and I think the internet is, has been a primary factor in this, there's been a shift towards taking a more evidence-based approach that uh, bodybuilders are becoming more aware not just many of them, at least not just to follow the uh, the bros, and that they will start now at least to give research more credence to some extent. I'm not saying that it's uh, there's still ways to go. And and like I also said earlier in the interview, that uh, there's something to be said that you can't just. It's not like research is the be all end all. You must uh, take the experience of, of what we know through training itself too into account because research is very limited into the bodybuilding segment. So I think, but I, I do think it's positive that there are now, there's more of an openness towards, uh, towards research I and mean, several pro bodybuilders, uh, I, uh, consult with a guy named John Meadows frequently. We've done work. Uh, he's a pro bodybuilder. One of the most astute guys I know. I mean, he's a really high level he's a pro bodybuilder and is, uh, one of the most respected in the field, and he uh, really puts his mind into the research and uh, and uses that to bridge the gap, as well as many others. I, I don't want to even start getting into names, and but uh, 
there's a lot now, I think, more understanding of the importance of it and a willingness to, uh, to utilize that and understand that uh, a lot of the research now, it's not, not just white lab coats, nerds. Absolutely. So speaking of white coats and nerds, if you had infinite resources, you, you were god of research, what, would, what studies would you like to see run if you had infinite resources, infinite bodies to throw interventions at? Um, what would you look at? You know, what, what is piquing your interest right now? Yeah, wouldn't that be nice? Well, I mean, I'd <laughs> want to run long-term studies using different periodization models uh, that would manipulate variables in different ways. Because, uh, first of all, short-term studies are good for what might happen in a given block, but uh, how the how things pan out over time is more relevant, obviously, with uh, much larger sample sizes and carried out in a metabolic ward where I can uh, where I can control everything. And of course you'd want to have the subjects that you'd want. So you'd have to be able to pay them large sums of money so that they will come and live in this metabolic ward or this fitness camp, whatever you wanted to do. Uh, so yeah, I, I mean, there's just so many studies that I'd like to do, but I think the uh, overriding point would be that they would be longer term. They would be well controlled or, or better controlled. Like I said, in metabolic wards, or, or a fit camp, whatever, where you'd go to an island and just fly everyone to uh, Honolulu and, you know, have a segment of that island cordon off where you'd carry out the study, make all the meals, just have the training, make sure you're uh, controlling their energy uh, intake and and, ex- uh, and exertions, and just look at different parameters, different uh different aspects, different training manipulations. Yeah, cool. Wrapping up here, you know, what's what's exciting on your roadmap for 2019? Uh, how do our listeners follow your work? You, you're on Twitter, you're on social channels, you know, let's do the, all the shout outs right here. You can find me on uh, Twitter, uh, Instagram. I'm being a lot more active. Facebook, I'm not quite as active as I was on Facebook just because the algorithms keep getting worse and worse. And but I mean, I'm on all those uh, all the social media platforms. Uh, they can I have different names on each one, I think. But if you just put my name in, you'll get me. I have a website called LookGreatNaked.com. Great domain. Uh, where people can uh, can find me, and I need to be posting more blog posts than I do. Uh, but I, I mean, I like to put out a lot of free content, and I uh, certainly do podcast interviews and I generally announce them and I will put this one on my social media to alert. Awesome. Thanks so much for taking the time to jump on. When you're next in San Francisco, give us a holler. We'll love to host you out here. Thanks for the offer, man. All right. Thanks so much. Thanks so much for tuning in this week, everyone. If you want to learn more about HVMN and our offerings, visit www.hvmn.com forward slash pod. Also, by writing a review on our iTunes page and sending a screenshot to podcast at hvmn.com, we'll hook you up with $15 worth of HVMN store credit. Our last shout out goes to our listener survey, which lets us know who you are better so we can continue making episodes that you find most valuable. So visit go.hvmn.com forward slash podcast survey. For that, it'll only take a few minutes and new submissions are eligible for an HVMN ketone giveaway. So it's well worth the time. Until next time, study smart, train hard, and live well.